I'd invite you to open your Bible this morning to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and our passage today is verses 1 through 6. Mark 6, verses 1 through 6. Lord willing, uh, we'll work through about a little over halfway uh, of this chapter and, and our last the last uh, message before Don returns will be the feeding of the 5,000. So that'll be uh, where, what we're working forward to here over these next several services. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, after the three accounts of Christ's miracles over the storms, over the spirits, and over sickness, he went away from there and came to his hometown And his disciples followed him, and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hand? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching." In John chapter 1 and verses 11 through 13, John writes, He came to his own, and his own own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." And the passage before us emphasizes this statement from John. They, they corroborate one another. Following, following the account of the four miracles that continue to verify the deity of Christ and, and His unique power, He goes to His hometown, and His hometown rejects His teaching. It emphasizes what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It it is the gift of God. What we're going to consider this morning is a critical truth. Knowing about Jesus, hearing preaching about Jesus, being surrounded by others who are in Christ, does not mean that you yourself know Christ. To state it another way, there is no salvation by proxy. Now, it might be that some who are outside of Christ and resist Christ would say, well, there's no reason for me to even come and hear about Christ, but the passage does not teach that it's better not to be under the preaching of Christ or to skip out on the preaching of Christ. No, your only hope is to continue to hear the preaching of Christ and to let the Word of God assault your soul, that Christ in His mercy will draw you to Himself. But what we do see in this passage is that familiarity alone does not produce saving faith. Familiarity alone does not produce saving faith. The people of Nazareth knew Christ from his childhood up, and yet they did not believe. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. The theme of the passage this morning is that natural proximity to Jesus cannot save you. Just depending on the fact that I've heard the Word, that I know what Scripture says, that I'm surrounded by people who know the Word of God, that that cannot save you. Natural proximity to Christ, to Jesus, 
cannot save you. The passage begins by directing our attention to Jesus' hometown. He went away from there and went to his hometown in Nazareth. He went inland from the coast of the, of the Sea of Galilee to Nazareth where he grew up. At the end, at the end of the passage, it identifies the unbelief that he found there. Look again at verse 6. He marveled, Christ, the God-man, he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, I, I admit that this is a sober approach to a new year. There's a sense that the, the passage is in a minor key, but knowing your standing in Christ is far more important uh, than a pep talk at the beginning of the year about new beginnings, because there is only one necessary new beginning, and that is to be in Christ. That is for those who are dead in trespasses and sins to return, to turn to Christ in repentance and faith as we're, we're brought into the gospel in, in chapter 1. What did Jesus preach? He preached the gospel. He declared the kingdom of God and he said, repent and believe in the gospel. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 that those who repent and believe the gospel, those who are transferred from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son, they are new creations. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And in the passage before us, we're looking at believing in Christ from the backside of unbelief. And this passage will help us understand some of the elements of unbelief, elements that, that characterize, it in, in, in a complete sense, those out of, outside of Christ. But there are also elements of unbelief that those in Christ deal with as we deal with our flesh. Ultimately, when we sin against the Lord, when we walk in the flesh, it's, it's part of that residual unbelief. And so when we recognize what unbelief is, it helps us to deal with our own soul before the Lord Jesus Christ. It leads us to repentance, and it leads us to faith. It leads us to cling to Christ, and it magnifies the cross. It magnifies our redemption in Christ, and it magnifies His righteousness that is imputed to us. So as we consider these sober things this morning, may the Lord give us grace to look at our souls in the light of His Word and may His Spirit do its wonderful, the wonderful convicting work, the wonderful encouraging work of showing us ourselves and showing us what Christ has done. Well, the first thing we're going to note from this passage this morning is that the teaching of Jesus reveals the state of your heart. The teaching of Jesus reveals the state of your heart. Again, look at the beginning of the passage. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. It's critical for us to understand in this passage what it is that elicited the response of the people. Why did they respond in astonishment? Why did they raise the questions that they raised? Well, it was because they were confronted with the teaching of Jesus. The teaching of Jesus reveals the state of your heart. And this is such a critical element to understand in a day where, where personal feelings, where personal truth, in quotation marks, is what defines a person. How do I know who I am? Well, I look at myself and figure out who I am. And it's wreaking havoc uh, 
on our society because as people look to themselves, they ignore the, the very clear biological evidence of who they are, much less spiritual reality of what they are before God. There is only one place to look to learn about yourself to learn about who you are, to learn about the state of your soul, the state of what part that part of you that that will endure forever and forever and forever. This body is going to go. The soul remains. And the soul will have an eternal destination with the Lord and the new heavens and new earth and the kingdom of God forever and ever, eternal life or apart from the gracious presence of God under His eternal wrath and the place prepared for the devil and his angels in hell. The most important part of you is your soul and the state of your soul. And it's the teaching of Jesus. It's the teaching of the Word of God, the fullness of which is found in the person of Christ that reveals the state of your heart. As Jesus and His disciples return to Nazareth, this is their second visit. The first visit was, in, was recorded in Luke chapter 4 and verses 16 through 30, early on in Christ's ministry, when He was at, right after His temptation in the wilderness. He went to His hometown to Nazareth, and He went to the synagogue, and He read a portion from Isaiah, And then he said, this is fulfilled in your midst. And the people didn't like that. In fact, in in that initial visit to the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown responded in wrath and they wanted to take his life. And now he comes back. (laughs) Oh, the, the grace of the Lord Jesus. They essentially expelled him, wanted to kill him, and yet he comes back and teaches them some more. He enters the synagogue to teach, and his teaching is what elicits the responses. But let's just refresh ourselves. What is it that Jesus taught? Here, we're just told that he taught, but what did he teach? What what would Jesus say? What was he communicating to those people that, that created this sense of astonishment and raised these questions which... The passage interprets, and this is a critical element in understanding this passage, the passage interprets what happened in the synagogue as unbelief. Why? Because Jesus marveled at their unbelief. So that's how we know that this response is a response of unbelief. This is Jesus' assessment of what is taking place. So what did he say? What what did he say that caused this response? Well, again, if you would turn back to Mark chapter 1, this is the theme of Jesus' ministry. Mark begins his account of Christ's ministry by summarizing what Jesus taught. And remember that the emphasis of Jesus' ministry is teaching and preaching The miracles are sign miracles that verify the message of who he was, but the primary primary emphasis of his ministry was preaching and teaching. And in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Mark records, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And so when Jesus is preaching and teaching, he is preaching and teaching some version of the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And if you turn to the first gospel, Matthew and, and look at Matthew chapter 4. And, and what we're doing, again, is just is simply pointing out for, for our benefit what it is that Jesus is teaching. And, you know, this is as we think about a new year and studying our Bibles and reading our Bibles, 
Uh, It's important that when we read a passage, you come to a passage, you ask questions about the the passage. Who, what, when, where, how, how, why, right? Those six questions, those are your best friends when studying the Bible. And and as you give attention to these these things, then then the Scripture continues to unfold and become so marvelous uh, in, in your eyes as you see the wisdom of God in inspiring this book. So what is Jesus teaching? Well, again, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, we have a summary, Matthew's summary of Jesus' preaching, and he says, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then if you look at chapter 5, 6, and 7, and no, we're not going to read all of those. But that is an extended sample of what Jesus was preaching when he was preaching repent. And this is how he started. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before them. Now, if you're a Jew and you're anticipating a Messiah that is going to restore your nation by casting out the Romans, and you hear, blessed are those who are destitute, blessed are those who mourn, all the way down to blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you? Wait, wait, wait. We, we were expecting a Messiah that was going to come in and cause us to be the victors, not the victims. It was absolutely offensive. And as Jesus moves through the sermon on the mount, and if you haven't listened to Pastor Don's series on this, you should make it one of your New Year's resolutions. It's like the New Testament version of the Ten Commandments. Christ, Christ is, is pressing in the spirit of the law to call people to repent, to turn to him, to repent, and to believe the gospel. It undoes. It undoes every vestige of personal self-righteousness. And at the end of this passage in chapter 7, if you turn over there in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of this sermon, we actually have an identical response recorded. Remember, Jesus taught in Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 6, and they were astonished. Well, Jesus has done the same thing in Matthew, and in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, Matthew records the response of those who heard. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at His teaching, for He was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Jesus is teaching that the kingdom of God is near. He's teaching that those who enter the kingdom of God are not those who are Jews by birth, but those who repent and believe the gospel. That means that the Jews are sinners. And that undoes their assumptions and their preconceptions about who the Messiah is and what He will do This is appalling to the Jews. What Jesus is saying is appalling to the Jews. They expected a political deliverer. They assumed that as God's chosen people, they needed no deliverance from sin. 
And they had even established a rigorous system to follow God's law. After, their, after the Jews, think about the Old Testament here, after the Jews were sent away into exile because of their pagan idolatry, God brought them back. He restored them. You, you can find the account at the, end of, at the end of 2 Chronicles and the beginning of Ezra, how God moved in the heart of a pagan king to bring them back. And from that point on, Israel no longer had a problem with, with going after pagan idolatry, but instead they established a rigorous system of self-righteousness reflected by the Pharisees. So they've insulated themselves with this thinking that we're Jews, and not only are we Jews, but we're no longer idolatrous like our forefathers were. We're keeping the law of God. We're only walking so far on the Sabbath day. We're fine. We're good. We're moral people. And they had the Scripture, and they knew the Scripture, and you see this all over the Gospels. Even Mary, when she, when she sings praise to God because of what the angel has told her, her, her song is filled with Old Testament references. In John chapter 5, when Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, he doesn't deny that they, that they know the Scriptures. No, they do. They know Moses. But he says, you don't understand what Moses was talking about. He was talking about me. These are good, quote unquote, good moral people. They know the scriptures, but the force, the force of Christ's authority undid them. It was the presence of Jesus and the power of his teaching, the authoritative application of the law to their souls that undid them and that astonished them. In his presence, in the presence of Christ, in the presence of the perfect man, the righteous son of God, their moral law keeping meant nothing. Their good deeds meant nothing. He taught that they were sinners and that their righteousness needed to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, the most respected spiritual leaders in their midst, and they were undone by that. Jesus said, if you will love me, you will keep my commandments. When the person of Christ when the person of Christ is made the preeminent goal in preaching and teaching, as was happening here when the person of Christ was present, when the person of Christ is made the preeminent goal in preaching, hearts are revealed. You know, people can hide behind a lot of technical exegesis. And it's good to exegete. I spent my life doing that. <laughs> but folks, you don't exegete for the sake of exegesis. You don't exegete for the sake of, small, of presenting small, nuanced truth that, that give a salve to the conscience and mind and say, okay, well, that was pretty cool to understand. Now I'm going to leave and go about my life. No, you exegete the Scriptures, you search the Scriptures, you study the Scriptures, you study theology, you pursue truth to come to the feet of the person of Jesus Christ. And it's the responsibility of those declaring the Word to bring to bear the person of Christ, even as Christ did when He taught. Those who... Those who love Christ will find great joy in that. And when that's not happening, they'll cry out, Oh, sir, sh sh show us Jesus. But those who loathe Christ, those who loathe Christ will resist it. They'll resist the authority. You know, this, this often happens over decades of, of being in, in church and, and various roles in ministry, you, you see this pattern. It's very sad. It's grieving. People come and are excited to learn about the Bible, which is wonderful. This is the living book of God. But as the Bible is continued to be taught, 
and the authority of Christ is held forth, the preeminence of Christ is held forth, and accountability comes to submit to Christ, the excitement turns off into incredulity and anger. What happened? There was excitement about the Scripture, but when it's about the person, when the Scripture leads us to the person and confronts us with His authority, then we have to make a decision. Are we going to submit to the Lord Jesus? Or will we turn away? John Owen, if you, if you want a good book, a good little book to read this year, John Owen, in one of his Puritan paperbacks, Apostasy from the Gospel, It was a great little book, a convicting little book. And in that book, he makes this statement. And again, thinking in terms about the authority of Christ being pressed in as the Word is taught. The unconverted mind is not willing to submit to the revelation given to it of the mind and will of God in Christ. Let me say, read that again. The unconverted mind is not willing to submit to the revelation given to it of the mind and will of God in Christ. And he goes on and he says this, Men, by conviction and for natural reasons and motives, may receive the gospel as truth. In other words, there's a joyful receptivity. There's excitement about the Bible, about what's being preached. But... But when that truth is applied to their consciences and the will and desires are called upon to repent of their own ways and instead walk in God's ways, then the old enmity rises up and objects. That's the continental divide. What do we do when the Word of God presses the authority of Christ on our consciences and calls us to repent and calls us to reconcile and calls us to turn to Christ. Oh, those in Christ and those who love Christ will submit because they know that God gives grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. But it's in the teaching of Christ, and that alone is Christ from the Scripture is brought to bear on the minds and hearts of men, that's when we find out what the state of our heart is. Are we submitted? Are we new creatures in Christ? Well, the second element that we see in this passage is increasingly sober. Unbelief takes offense at Christ. Unbelief takes offense at Christ. We've seen that the teaching of Christ reveals your state before the Lord. Secondly, unbelief takes offense at Christ. So Jesus is teaching. He's teaching in the synagogue. Those who hear are are astounded, astonished. Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given by by him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Unbelief. Unbelief dominates the natural man, and it dwells residually in the converted. So what is unbelief? Unbelief. Well, here's a simple definition. It's, it's actually a definition of the word used in this passage, and I think it's a good one. Unwillingness to commit oneself to another or respond positively to the other's words or actions. Unbelief is an unwillingness to commit oneself to another or to respond positively to the other's words or actions. And, and, you know, this comes out in, in many different ways. There's a kind of a spectrum of unbelief. It, unbelief is unbelief, but there's a spectrum of how it, 
comes out. There's radical unbelief that denies the person of Christ outright. And in Romans chapter 11 and verse 20, Paul says that the Jews who right now are are rejecting Christ were broken off for that time because of their outright rejection of Christ, because of their radical unbelief concerning Christ. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19, the writer of Hebrews says that the, the Jews in the Old Testament They failed to enter the promised land because of unbelief, because they outright denied who God was and His power to deliver them from their enemies. Radical unbelief is just an outright denial of Christ, but there's another more subtle form of unbelief, and that is a practical unbelief, a practical unbelief that acknowledges Christ but dismisses His authority. Practical unbelief acknowledges Christ, but dismisses His authority. In other words, there are people that wouldn't be caught dead saying that Christ isn't Lord or that He didn't come, but when they live their lives, they live it entirely dismissive of His authority over them. That's a practical unbelief. Sinful anger, for instance, sinful anger responds with amplified frustration to, to circumstances that, that have gone other than planned and that have aroused uh, pride and, 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 and a desire to remove what the obstacle is. Sinful anger res- responds with amplified frustration instead of belief that God is good, instead of faith that His, His work is being done. Sinful anxiety responds with amplified fear and not faith. We look at the circumstances and we think about what if, what if, what if, what if, and there isn't a rest in the goodness of God who is ordaining all things for good. It's a form of unbelief. Lust grows from inflamed desires of the flesh, not faith of being satisfied with what God has given in the time that He has given it. Grumbling springs from unfulfilled wants and not faith. Sinful depression responds to loss with despair and not faith. And, and you know, each one of these things that I've mentioned, we could probably take a whole message to explore those things and how we deal with them scripturally, but I just want to point out, my goal here this morning is to point out this reality that, that to some degree or another, we're, we're constantly dealing with unbelief in our lives. And we need God's grace to help us to see how it springs up that we might continually turn to Christ. And so as we work through these responses of Jesus' hometown, it helps us to assess our souls. When we look at what they're saying, when we look at the heart behind what they're saying, Am I, seeing, am I seeing this in my own life, in the light of Christ and who He is? The passage records some symptoms of unbelief. We're going to move through them rather quickly here this morning. First of all, we see that unbelief responds to the authority of Christ with shock. They were astonished. Now, that can be a neutral reaction might be positive, might be negative, but the context of the passage fills out for us that there is unbelief behind these responses. They're they're undone. In the modern vernacular, their mind is blown. In other words, you could say that unbelief holds a high view of oneself. We didn't, we didn't know that we were that bad. We didn't know that we needed to repent. We didn't know that we needed to believe the gospel. We were, we're Jews. We're Jews. It's pride. It's pride that, that when confronted by Christ, responds in that kind of astonishment. And pride blinds. <laughs> 
Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Again, Paul is giving us an explanation generally of how the Jews respond to Jesus. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, as Paul is defining and defending his ministry, listen to what he says about what happens in the minds of the Jews, what's going on when they hear Christ preached. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14, "...but their minds were hardened." For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yet to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom." And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. There's a contrast that Paul is making. He says the Jews, their their mind is veiled, they're hardened by their pride, they're hardened by their self-righteousness. And only in a response to the person of Jesus Christ, only in a response to the fact that He is the Messiah, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Redeemer, and that His righteousness is what is required, it's only in that kind of repentant, believing response that the veil is lifted. And what happens when the veil is lifted? Oh, when the veil is lifted transformation starts to happen. We're transformed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. He gives grace to the humble. But they were shocked. They were astonished. They were proud. Second, going back to Mark chapter 6, another element of unbelief. And this is a subtle form for sure, but Unbelief does accept Christ to a point. Look at verse 2 in the middle of the verse. Where did this man get these things? And what is his wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? These questions acknowledge that there's something unusual about Christ. He has wisdom. Now, later on, they're going to say, well, he's a carpenter. And in the Jewish mind, that that would not make sense. How how could someone who works with his hands, who's a a, a blue-collar worker, for lack of a better term, and, and he builds things, how could he have this rabbinical wisdom that comes only from hanging around with rabbis? He hasn't been with rabbis. He doesn't have any any rabbinical degrees from popular uh, rabbis where he could get this wisdom. And and they're raising this question, how how could this man who's a carpenter get the wisdom? They're not denying he has the wisdom, but they're asking where to get it from. Nor are they denying his mighty works. And this might explain even why they're not quite as angry as they were the first time. I mean, they've seen him heal people. His reputation has preceded him. They're not denying the mighty works. He does great things, but they're raising the question, how how does he get those? They don't go as far as the religious leaders to say he's of Beelzebub, but yet they're still questioning And they're missing the obvious answer of what Jesus has declared about who he is. He's the Son of God. The demons know it. They've recognized it. His own town misses it. Unbelief accepts Christ to a point. And and this is something that we have to wrestle with because we can't just say, well, you know what? I, I believe the facts about Christ in the Bible. Therefore, I'm a Christian. Now, unbelief will accept Christ to a point, but it raises questions. And ultimately, when the 
authority of Christ is applied, unbelief attempts to redirect the conversation. Unbelief attempts to redirect the conversation. Verse 3, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are these not, are, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. What's happening? Well, the questions about trade and family connections are an attempt to undermine his authority. The, the idea here is, hey, you know what? We knew this guy when he was a kid. Who does he think he is calling us to repentance? And there might even be an underlying uh, attempt to illegitimize his authority by naming only his mother instead of Joseph and a reference to the circumstances around his birth. It's a little bit unclear, but the point is they're redirecting the conversation away from the, the authority of Christ and His authority to call them to repent. And they're bringing up questions. Hey, we know this guy. How, how does he have the right to call us to repent? Now, just a side note here. Those questions, under the guidance of the Spirit of God and Mark's recording of these questions, those questions provide important details about Christ's family life, don't they? He had brothers, he had sisters, and he was a carpenter. And it completely undermines the wrong teaching of the Catholic Church of the perpetual virginity of Mary. You can't, you can't accept the authority of the Scripture and believe that error. But those questions are also an attempt to redirect the conversation. And Jesus understands this. In verse 4, Jesus says, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his relatives in his own household. In Jesus' statement, what we find is that unbelief is the natural response to a supernatural person. Unbelief is the natural response to a supernatural person. The natural response is when someone grows up among you and then dares to say anything authoritative. It's like, oh, isn't that so cute? He is such a nice boy, right? A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. You can see it repeated over and over when, when, when men go back to where they've grown up, it often, the, the response is often like this. It, it's almost impossible there's a natural response. We knew that guy when he was a little guy. He has no right. But Jesus is a supernatural person. And his statement, though, is recognizing that the people of Nazareth, although they grew up right next to him, although they, they knew this sinless man, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16, they knew Christ only according to the flesh. It's a natural response to a supernatural person. And folks, a natural response will go so far. It'll acknowledge that he's unique. It'll acknowledge that he does, that he does unique works, but it's not a saving response. Now, later on, two of his brothers, James and Jude, at least two of his brothers, repent and come to Christ, and that's a supernatural work. But here... Unbelief is, re is responding naturally to a supernatural person. Jesus, back in chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 4 in the parable of the seeds. Go ahead and look back there. Parable of the soils. In verse 17, I'm sorry, verse 16, Jesus talks about people people's hearts, 
in terms of there are those that are sown on the rocky ground. Those are ones that when they hear the Word of God, they immediately receive it with joy, and yet they have no root in themselves, but they endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the Word, immediately they fall away. And the word fall away is the same word that we have in chapter 6 when it says that the people took offense at him. People receive the word with joy. There's there's a, a willingness to accept Christ to a point. But when the Word of God starts to exert authority and accountability on the conscience and call us to repentance, then those who are characterized by rocky soil, they fall away. They're offended by the Word. This is an issue that prevailed through the early church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, and just let's, or chapter 1, again, turn over there. These are a few more scriptures that I'm used to turning to, but I think it'll be helpful for us to look here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and see how this attitude has to constantly be guarded so that we can maintain our commitment to the gospel and maintain our commitment to Christ. Paul starts his instructions to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. He says, I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion. What's going on in chapter 6 of Mark? The people are hearing the, the teaching of Christ, but they're raising irrelevant issues to undermine the authority of Christ. They're raising issues about genealogies and speculations. Where did this man get these, get these things? And so Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you need to watch out for the same thing in the church because when the authority of Christ is preached, when the person of Christ is preached, when the conviction of God is applied to the consciences of of men and women and children, when people are called to repent, then there's going to be an attempt to raise speculation and raise vain discussion, and that's not faith, it's unbelief. Guard against it, Timothy. Guard against it. Don't allow that natural response. Don't allow that attempt to redirect the conversation. I won't turn there, but in 2 Timothy or 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, Peter warned about the same thing about people who would come in and twist the word of God, torture the word of God, false teachers. He said, watch out for those people. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't, don't be deluded by the vain discussions of unbelieving people. Unbelief, when confronted with the authority of Christ, this is the nature of unbelief. When it's confronted with the authority of Christ, it will seek a loophole that sounds spiritual while dismissing the authority of Christ. It's subtle, it's dangerous, and it's destructive. In verse 5, the outcome, unbelief eliminates the powerful presence of Christ. Here he is in his hometown, and they take offense at him, and he could do no mighty work there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Christ is still compassionate, but the purpose of his miracles was to validate his teaching, 
And when his teaching is rejected, there's no amount of miracles that's, that will change the heart. If people aren't responding to the Word of God, they won't be responding to the works of God. The issue here is that Jesus limited the work He did out of mercy. The more that He did, the more they would be culpable for. It's not an issue that their unbelief overpowered Christ. It wasn't that He was incapable of doing the work. It's that He limited it. He did not do works where no true faith was to be found. Any form of religion that demands a spectacle instead of Scripture is a denial of Christ. In that day, it was miracles. In our day, it is very often experience. I need to have a spectacle of an experience. I need to, need to have some charismatic, over-the-top, Yahoo moment. That's not, that's not faith. That's unbelief. And so often, people put, they put their, their stock in an experience while their lives are a disaster. And they just keep, well, I had this experience. No, it's not about the experience. It's about whether you're, you're submitting to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ through the teaching of His Word. This is, this is a danger for the church. We can allow subtly... We can allow unbelief into our lives, into our midst, that eliminates the powerful presence of Christ. There are three churches in Revelation where this happened. There are seven total that Jesus write to, but three stand out. Ephesus left their first love. They were called to repent. The church of Sardis, Jesus says, you have a name and you have a look, you have an exterior that makes people think you're alive, but you're not, you're dead. Repent. Laodicea, you're rich, you're self-sufficient, you think you see, you're needy, you're poor, and you're blind. Repent. Oh, that the Lord would keep our, our hearts tender to the authority of Christ that no, that no root of unbelief would come in at the cost of the powerful presence of the Lord Jesus. Finally, we see that unbelief draws the amazement of Christ. Verse 6, He marveled. He marveled because of their unbelief. This is a marvelous statement. <laughs> How did Jesus marvel? He knows all things. He is God in flesh, yet He marveled at their unbelief. Well, there's a number of elements with this unbelief that, that make this stand out. This is an un, uninformed unbelief. It is an informed unbelief. Unbelief. They were informed about Jesus. They grew up with Jesus. They saw his mighty works. They recognized his wisdom, and they still did not believe. The Nazarites knew a lot of things about Jesus, including that he was wise, including that he did miraculous works, but they're offended at him because of unbelief. And Jesus is amazed. I wonder, I wonder if Jesus is amazed when he looks at the church as a whole, not just our body, but as a whole, the professing church, and perhaps in our body. I wonder if he's amazed at how people who listen to the Word, who read the Word, who profess to know Him and to serve Him, become offended when His authority is proclaimed. Are we tender 
Are we submitted? Do we read the Word because we're trying to attain a sense of our own righteousness? Do we listen to sermons because we're trying to attain a sense of our own righteousness? Or are we doing it because we love God and we want Him to keep changing us into His image? Oh, may the Lord give us grace to remain tender to His Word and to not be the source of amazement from Christ at our unbelief. Unbelief shows the amazement of Christ or or draws the amazement of Christ. Well, as we close this morning, I have a third main point. We've seen that the teaching of Christ reveals the state of your heart. We've seen that unbelief takes offense at Christ. And the third point is not necessarily explicitly in the text, but I think the implication is clear, and it's a point of encouragement for us. Conversion is a miracle. I think that if we were listening to what the Word of God had for us to this point, we, there's, a, there's a sense that we would all grieve, right? Right? And say, oh Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We we see this. The the sensitive, regenerated soul sees the, the rudiments of this even in their own lives. Conversion is a miracle. In Nazareth, the 500 or so people that lived there had ample opportunity to know Christ and to believe him. They they grew up with him, the sinless Son of God. And yet they were offended because of their unbelief. They remained blinded. John says that those who are given the right to become the children of God are those who are born of God. It is a miracle. It is of grace. When you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, it is because Christ has made you alive. He gave you faith through the hearing of the word. Just like his voice summoned Lazarus and the little girl from the dead, Christ calls his children to himself. Conversion, conversion transforms someone drowning in unbelief, an unbeliever to a true believer, and it's a miracle. It's being born of God. And if you are here this morning and By God's grace, the truth of regeneration, the truth of conversion, the authority of Christ is resonating in your soul. You are the object of God's miraculous saving grace. You're a believer. And those who believe in Christ show it. They pray because they love the Lord. They read the Word of God because they love the God of the Word. They fellowship with God's people because they love the body of Christ. And they obey the commands of their dear Lord because they love Him more than anything else. And they're looking forward to seeing Him and being found at peace without spot and blameless at His return. And it's a miracle. Conversion is a miracle. For true believers, what matters to Christ matters to them. What mattered to Christ did not matter to the Nazarites. But those who are converted, it's what matters to Christ matters to them. So as we look at a new year, may we be diligent. May we be diligent to see where unbelief might be springing out and to turn to our gracious Lord in repentance, confessing our sins, right? uh, We need to confess the things that we do that are wrong. Oh, but we need to confess the roots of unbelief that spring up in our souls. We need to repent and receive the forgiveness that He offers so freely. As a final exhortation as we close this morning,
I want to just speak to the children here again. Children, you are blessed that your parents love you enough to bring you to a church to put you under the Word of God. You are blessed to live in a home where parents love the Lord, where they're striving to please the Lord. But please, please never, never mistake family religion for personal conversion. Because natural proximity to Christ, whether it's at church, whether it's in your family, natural proximity to Christ, that does not save you. You aren't saved by your parents' salvation. You need to turn to the Lord Jesus. You need to understand that your heart is an unbelieving heart, and you need to repent and believe the gospel. And may the Lord increase those that he calls to himself according to his decrees as we hold forth the word of God in our midst. May we see many continue to come to Christ, many converted as the church of Christ in this local body moves forward, not, not in unbelieving rejection of Christ, but in belief that salvation is of the Lord and we love the Lord of salvation. Father, we thank you today that the word of God is true. We thank you that Christ has come to bring salvation. And Lord, we pray that you would do a great work in our midst to convict of sin, to renew in refreshment of repentance, that as we start a new year, as we turn the page of the calendar, we would do so with a renewed trust in you and a renewed love for you. We do love you. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us today. Thank you for each person that has come to hear the word of God. And we pray that as we dismiss in a few moments that we would go forth with joy and in renewed strength in Christ to serve you faithfully. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening from Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. You can find more church information and other helpful materials at thetruthpulpit.com, teaching God's people God's Word. This message is copyrighted, all rights reserved.